Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Salvador Munoz, and I am the Public Programs Manager at Poster House, the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Uh, tonight's program, Representations of Blackness in Chinese Popular Culture, is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, The Sleeping Giant, Posters in the Chinese Economy, on view through February 14th. Tonight's panel is in partnership with Gung Ho Projects, a platform for cultural exchange in theater and film who will be monitoring this discussion. Before we jump into the panel, I just wanted to provide a few housekeeping details for all of our lovely guests, and then I'll go ahead and hand it over. So we're going to close the chat function during the presentation so as not to distract the panelists, but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and we'll try and answer them when we can at the end of the panel. We'll also open up the channel at the end during the Q&A portion. So we will be able to hear from all you lovely people at the end. Uh, closed captioning is provided in English for those who need it, and it can be turned on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your transcript, at the bottom of your screen, sorry. And lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge the complex and sensitive nature of the topic of this panel and note that some of the images we'll be seeing tonight when viewed from a Western or US perspective are closely related to blackface. Our goal in sharing these images is to provide context as it relates to the topic, but I recognize that these sensitive images may cause discomfort for our audience, so I offer this information in advance of the presentations. So all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to tonight's co-moderators, Wen Xuan Shui and Michael Levenleft. Wen Xuan is a theater artist originally from Beijing and a PhD student at Tufts University, as well as a company member at Gung Ho. Michael is a theater and film director who has worked extensively in China and is the artistic director of Gung Ho Projects. Thank you, Salvador, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for folks tuning in. I think there are over 200 people now. Um, thank you. And I just want to first thank you, uh, thank Poster House for sponsoring this event and thank Salvador and everyone at the team for all the logistical uh, support that make this event possible. Um, I want to thank Michael for inviting me to co-host this panel. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Keisha, uh, Claire, and Faye for joining this panel and also preparing your presentations over the past month. And I am so excited to learn from all of you today. Today's panel is going to run about an hour and a half. Each panelist will present some fascinating case studies um, looking at various forms of representation of Blackness in Chinese popular culture. They're going to be exploring theater, advertising, hip hop, and some a lot of other elements. We're going to have a Q&A session uh, open to all of you at the end of the presentations, but feel free to submit questions as we go along in case things pop to mind. Um, and we also want to note that this panel is going to be recorded and we hope to make some excerpts available online afterwards. So 2020 has been a year of global insurgency. The call for racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement from the US have been covered widely in China and also have sparked new conversations uh, such as these today and also local organizing. Similarly, in the 60s, the US civil rights movement also happened simultaneously with the anti-war movement, uh, global decolonization, third world alliance, and cultural revolution in People's Republic of China, all of which impacted, inspired, and collided with one another. So at Poster House current exhibition, The Sleeping Giant, Posters and the Chinese Economy, there are multiple examples of propaganda posters that feature a sense of Sino-Black or Afro-Asian Afro solidarity. Uh, I invite all of you to read the blog article by Ruo Yijiang to view these fascinating archives at Poster House. Whether as scholars or as artists or as consumers of culture, we're hoping today's panel can help us consider representations of Blackness in a global context and how ideas of nationalism, language, culture, and race tra traverse borders. We want to acknowledge that our topic today lies at a complex and sometimes sensitive intersection, and we encourage everyone to approach this material with both openness and a critical eye. The examples that our panelists will share are by no means exhaustive. There's so much to explore here, but we hope that tonight's conversation can be part of an ongoing discourse. So let's get started. 
Um, we're going to hear first from Dr. Keisha A. Brown from Tennessee State University. Keisha is a historian of modern China with a particular focus in what she has termed Sino-Black relations. We're so excited to have you here from Nashville, um, and I'll let you get started, Keisha. Thanks. Thank you and good evening. And again, I echo everyone's sentiments. Thank you to Poster House for organizing this and thank you to the conveners as well. I'm, I was really excited to be invited to this particular talk. So thank you for um, including me and in my research in this panel. Um, so with that being said, um, as mentioned, my name is Keisha Brown. I'm from Tennessee State and it's talking about college and university here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm one of three in the city. So I always like to mention that to say I bring you land, uh, so greetings from the land of, of golden sunshine. So I'm gonna share my screen and pull up my presentation for you all. And so one of the things I really want to think about it and begin with is um, how I got into this space. I am a Chinese historian. I'm the resident uh, quote unquote Asianist. I'm the one who does all the Asian studies uh, curriculum development in my program. And people always ask, how did you get to China? What led you to be interested in China? That's not in some ways a traditional trajectory they would think of from a, a black girl from the South. I'm from Georgia originally. And one of the influences was my Chinese teacher. I went to a public Family Black High School in Lafonia, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta. And it was in that space where uh, through my Chinese teacher, I went to China for the first time. And ever since then, it's been an interesting uh, place I wanted to study and know more about. And so I began to continue to cultivate my language development, but also wanted to understand um, why when I was in China, the question of my, uh, my representation, my uh, Blackness and my nationality was some way seen incompatible in some spaces. Uh, me saying I was American was causing some conflict some people's ideas of what Americans can um, be or what Americans look like. And it had me thinking about how do we think about these in uh, conversations and these ideas when it comes to thinking about uh, representations. And so that was originally uh, my uh, dissertation title, Representations of Blackness in Maoist China. Um, but as you can see here on the slide, I kind of scratched through that and I know that's not a, a typo. Um, that's in some ways kind of intentional because I continue to uh, do the work shifting from Maoist China to more contemporary understandings of uh, the issues of blackness and race, ethnicity, and what I like to think of as networks of difference in the China space has me thinking more about lesser representations and thinking about the process of translation, how we think about translation and not in terms of words or text, but translations in terms of identity and cultures from one place to the next, what gets lost in translation and what is filling those gaps and how do we need to kind of think about and critique those as well, or analyze and understand what's causing these gaps to be filled in in certain ways that leads to certain uh, outcomes. So as I mentioned, it's in popular culture, and I'm looking more today at different advertisements, thinking of the kind of consumer culture, the consumption aspect, if you will, and how do we in some ways interrogate and address some of these particular questions in the advertising space. These kind of short snippets, these mediums that while not long, they do provide some information while also trying to sell some kind of product. So what in terms of market research output, what is going into the creation of these ideas that's being marketed and how do we think about those in some different ways? And so I'm looking at advertisements mostly but also engaging in one or two other examples as well. I want to begin by playing this particular ad, um, the Joey uh, Jean Boyega and the Joe uh, Malone kind of controversy. Um, this was very much um, happened um, in, uh, I think it was recently in 2020, it was September of 2020, when the uh, Chinese uh, advertisement was released. Um, and it became a big controversy, uh, one, because uh, John Boyega, who was the original creator of this ad for Joe Malone, a London-based uh, perfume and candle, uh, scented candle company, it was released in London in 2019. And it was him being able to have creative uh, control. And he put his own perspective of what it means to be a London gentleman, that's what he called it, the London gent, into the ad, including his own family and friends, places that were important to him, people that were important to him, sights and sounds of London that were important to him that made him who he was. To try to evoke this idea of Joe Malone as this kind of candle that's making him in some ways evoke what uh, he means to himself. And so it actually was so successful that it actually won an award. It won an award for the best media campaign in 2020. And then it was um, changed when it went to the China market space. As a result, he ended his uh, partnership with them. He was, an he was a 
spokesperson. So he ended that conversation with them. And I want to show this clip that shows the two ads juxtaposed. You want to see the one that he produced originally, and then I'll see the uh, Chinese version um, that was released in 2020 that caused so much controversy, leading him to sever that relationship with this particular company. Can you hear the sound? Can you hear the sound? <laughs> yes, no, yes, okay, good. And so while their videos are not a one-to-one -one screen to screen parallel, we do see some very striking contrast. And so there are a few questions that has uh, me thinking. One is since the original was released in 2019 in London and the Chinese uh, the Chinese version with uh, Leo Haran was released in 2020, was it released and done the same way because it was so successful and won an award? But two, if that was the way they were going to do it, why not consult with either uh, John Boyega or Leo Haran? I run. So what happened in 2020 in September when they released this video, in addition to um, him severing ties with them, they had to, in many cases, release apologies to both actors because they did the Chinese version without in some ways consulting the actor on what his vision was for a particular uh, image, even though he was a spokesperson for this company in China. So what happens in these spaces was this disconnect when they're trying to translate it. Was it just because it was successful and they were trying to tailor to a different marketplace? Or is there some kind of historical connection where an idea of contestation blackness or blackness is not seen as a sellable tool in the Chinese market spaces. And so I want to kind of think about some historical tropes and why these are not all the representations of blackness in China. Um, don't get me wrong and say this is the only way people are depicted. There is in some ways some historical ways in which these tropes come over and over and over, especially in advertisement and different kind of uh, visual mediums that lead to some problematic discourses, especially considering um, the glowing influence that between the uh, China and Africa relationships between China and various African nations, as well as the growing population of people uh, of African nationals and Black Americans still moving to and living in China. And so the first on the far left is the idea of blackface. Um, the blackface image where this is from the CCTV uh, uh, Chinese New Year celebration from 2018. 
um, where you have in the middle uh, this Chinese actress who is adorned in not only blackface to make her skin darker, but she also has different uh, body adornments to make her body look in this particular shape. You can see it's not a natural shape. They put different padding to represent an image where they think a black female could look like in these spaces. And while the video and this kind of whole skit was supposed to be celebrating China Africa collaboration and kind of the renewal of those uh, multiple relationships, what happened is that the translation of the way in which it was depicted led to some questions and problems of thinking, is this in some ways how the Chinese government sees us? Is this how people in China see us? And what does that mean in terms of our relationships on the everyday, day-to-day -day level? Um, another one is kind of a ratio of blackness that I mentioned here in the middle is from a um, Maturgeon ad is a Chinese company, uh, Chow Bee, I believe it's called. And this is from 2016, um, where this ad is uh, one where um, when they issued an apology, the company said they were inspired by an ad originally from France. And they kind of took another ad and kind of translated it uh, and for the Chinese uh, market to sell their product to show that this product does a good job at quote unquote cleaning to the point of where it can clean all someone's blackness where the black man is pushed into the, the washing machine. He comes out this Chinese, uh, in the Chinese male. So getting these questions of why was that seen as effective if you're trying to promote cleanliness, what are you trying to say and why in some ways the erasure of blackness was seen as useful in this particular space. And then an image on the far right is from a This is Africa exhibit. This was in the Hubei Provincial uh, Museum in Wuhan and this was from 2017. And this is another exhibit where even the name itself, This is Africa, and this idea of a depiction of the juxtaposition of an African individual next to an animal and what is trying to be said in this space as well. And so I bring up these tropes because these are recent examples that many people who are navigating China space, who are working there, who live there, who are Black, are trying to navigate these spaces where they're in China different spaces. Unfortunately, some of these tropes are not new, nor are they unique to, the, uh, to China. We can see some of these same parallels in our own kind of media um, coverage, where you have the erasure of Blackness, where it's not necessarily completely going white, but you have the skin lightening of people uh, without their consent for different uh, ads. You have the idea of kind of Blackface happening, um, especially around when people try to wear costumes or this adornment of blackness, or now in a sense of now they call it something called digital blackness, digital blackface, where the idea of using um, certain black uh, memes of black individuals and certain kind of gifts to represent something where this idea of trying to adorn uh, certain modes of conversation that are some ways thinking about this idea of digital blackface in this kind of new 21st century. And then also the images and thinking about the tropes about blackness here in the United States as well. So while I'm not saying this is unique to China, there is a history there as well in thinking about these images and how they happen over over and over again, but even recently, I think as uh, 2019, there was another ad when individuals were adorning blackface and wearing kind of primitive clothing to try to sell an ad about, I think it was a cell phone or some kind of cellular service. So how do these events keep happening? What is happening in these moments? And when they're trying to translate to sell something, what is happening in that process and what's filling in those gaps? Now, when I think about this in terms of uh, historically, one of the things I do in my own dissertation research, and, uh, and hopefully if I get it all finished in time, uh, my manuscript is thinking through this throughout the 20th century and thinking through some of the early 20th century ideas. And I know that uh, Claire's gonna talk more about this in her own research um, and think of their presentation on a uh, performance in theater. Um, but the translation of certain texts, such as Uncle Tom's Cabin, a uh, mistranslation in 1901, around the turn of the 20th century, and how these ideas about nationality and about the understanding of the nation state and thinking through what it means to be in this particular new space as China was coming towards the end of the Qing Dynasty, moving towards the idea we see kind of slowly eroding the uh, end of the Qing Dynasty, moving towards the Republican era. What does it mean in those places? And I bring up Uncle Tom's Cabin because it was one written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. So it's given a secondhand account of what uh, she understood slavery to be. Um, it's also when it was translated in Chinese, in many cases, the black body, the black slave was seen as a metonym um, for the Chinese struggles, for their own kind of struggles against uh, Western imperialism and equating the slave struggle in the United States to that of the Chinese coolies um, in different parts of the Caribbean and South America. And so these kind of early moments, there's a way in which these understandings of uh, blackness and nation state and kind of thinking through these ideas becomes very interesting. Um, a second example that kind of talks about this as well is the translation of some uh, African-American literature from the uh, Harlem Renaissance. So people like um, Langston Hughes, uh, works of people like um, 
a Claude McKay. Some of their poems were translated into Chinese. And so as they're thinking through um, Chinese modern literature, they're thinking through the kind of ideas of nation state and things. In the 20s and 30s, when Langston Hill actually goes to China, um, this idea of what does it mean to think about these ideas from a particular position, especially if one sees himself as marginalized in some of these spaces. And so this idea of thinking about the Black voice or the Black body, in some cases as a metonym for thinking through their own ideas or struggle or identity and how we get co-opted together in some interesting ways that we see change uh, very profoundly in the uh, mid-19, uh, uh, mid-20th century with the establishment of the PRC, where it becomes very much about a political tool to in some ways oppose uh, U.S. imperialism. And then thinking through that kind of political moment and thinking about the agency of both individuals who are going as well as the U.S. out of China's uh, foreign policy, this idea of where they're trying to promote in that particular space and moving to thinking through today where I um, had a really good conversation with a, a really great undergrad student recently where she's looking at kind of pop culture and an idea of like pop culture in this moment um, and how this can be very useful for thinking through these kind of new transnational engagements in this very globalized context. And so there is a history where we see in many cases representations of Blackness um, have a long history in China, how it's been used or in some ways deployed for different reasons. But also I'm thinking about the idea of focusing on the motion of erasure of Blackness. What does it mean to kind of deploy this as a tool, but also in some ways see it as something that's not necessarily to be accepted or rejected. And I want to give an example. Um, I think I gave a talk uh, kind of parallel on this um, back in uh, a little bit earlier, uh, um, I think it was maybe in March of last year. And one of the questions that came up was how is what you're talking about unique to China? What makes this unique to the China space? And so I looked to some scholars who also use critical mixed race studies in their own work to understand ideas about race in China. And one such scholar is, um, individual um, named Catherine uh, Clayton, who has a really interesting book chapter uh, called Mixing Blood and Race, representing uh, Huanxia in contemporary China, where she talks about this concept of how we think about their very unique networks of difference, uh, as I like to call it, in the China space, where it's not the same as thinking through race and ethnicity in the same we do in the Western context, but how they're using different modes of identity formation and identity markers in the China space. And so thinking through the idea of blood, what does that mean? Um, how we use blood and lineage, those kind of long-standing networks, as well as other scholars who don't work on the idea of kinship and how those are also in some ways unique to the China space and thinking through identity. And so I'm very careful not to use uh, race and racism to impose those into the Chinese conversation, but to try to use their own uh, understandings of identity and formation and who is who and how do we get to those understandings to think through this as well. And so I wanna give one last example is in the uh, young lady in the middle with her mother. Uh, this is uh, Lo Jean, and it's a really great article by Todd Frazier um, and, Jen, uh, and and Lin Zhang, um, who write about uh, the, what happened to her in terms of her uh, appearance on a Chinese um, kind of pop show, right? Uh, this kind of um, kind of a, a singing show, a singing competition, and where what happened in terms of uh, the comments, the kind of trolling the internet censor, or the way people talking about her and her mother in these spaces, opened up some interesting conversations about identity about uh, Blackness in the China space and what does it mean. Um, so you can see here, this is her mother. She is Chinese. Her father is uh, Black, African-American, uh, but she was raised in China by her mother. So she is, uh, you know, she's Chinese. Um, she identifies as Chinese because that is the place she knows. It's a nationality. That's the culture she knows. She was raised uh, by a single parent, by her mother only. And so when she went on to this particular competition, it kind of put those issues that she may be struggling with kind of personally in her local space on a national level and open up some conversations conversations where uh, they would call her a chocolate girl as if that was a compliment. Um, they even had a point up here where on this particular image is when they bought her mother out. It was basically became a national questioning about this idea of um, almost making the mother feel shame, not for being a single mother, but for being a single mother to a biracial daughter. And this idea of what does it mean to in some ways interrogate her particular Chineseness because of her blackness as well. And so I want to think about some of these questions more critically. Um, like I said, I'm still thinking through this idea of translation, more sort of representation, um, to think about what's happening in those spaces where there's something is lost, um, because it's very hard to, in some ways, translate one to one. Um, think about these ideas as well. I'll leave you on one last point. I know I'm told I'm not well over time, um, but thinking through ideas of performativity of race as well. And this becomes important because we think about identity, it has two uh, markers. One is a scribe and one is self. A scribe is how others see you. They look at you and make assumptions. 
The self is how you see yourself and how you someone identifies yourself. And in many cases, in those gaps between how you see yourself and how someone else sees you, this kind of external gaze, I like to think about idea of performativity of race. And it's complements this idea of translation because you think about performativity. You have an audience and a performer. And what is the intention? What is the meaning being conveyed? What is the meaning being understood? And how people in some ways fill it in those gaps of understanding to go to some of these easy narratives they can go back to, these easy tropes that make it in some ways problematic. Um, so this is just one aspect of thinking about Blackness in China. I know my other two panelists have different uh, perceptions and we can have a really good conversation about how we think through this question and get to the nuance and complexities of thinking about this particular topic. And with that being said, I will stop my share. And I will pass it over to uh, uh, back to to Michael. So I hope I wasn't too long. <laughs> oh, that was great! Thank you so much, Keisha, for getting us started. That's such a helpful framework. Um, and particularly when you're talking about translation and performativity, we're going to now move into theater um, and and performance there, and then also into hip hop. So I'm going to uh, first turn it over to uh, Dr. Claire Concisen, who's a professor of theater arts at MIT. Claire teaches and researches contemporary theater and representation of foreigners on Chinese stages. So Claire, I'll let you take it away. Hi, I just have to get the screen share. Here we go. Hello everybody, how are you? Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight to your probably 10,000th Zoom, Zoom activity. <laughs> Um, do you need me to go to full screen for this? Is it better for the images? Yes? Okay. So my name is Claire Concisen. I teach at MIT and um, I'm really excited to share this uh, portion of my research with you. And I'm also really excited that Keisha just brought up the idea of performativity and, and race as performance because it's very, um, relevant to what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So I first went to China as a teenager in 1985, which was pretty early when there were not many foreigners living in China. And if you were walking in the street and you stopped, a big crowd of like 100 people would form around you and they were very curious. Um, most of them had never seen a non-Chinese before. So that what some of my earliest memories um, and impressions of being in China are being the foreign other. And when I went back as a grad student in 1990 to 91, uh, doing my master's, I continued to be intrigued by this dynamic as it developed. And then through the 90s, I would go in the summers and then also went when working on my dissertation. And the more plays I attended in China, because my research was on uh, Chinese theater, uh, I saw both um, adaptations and stagings of foreign plays from you know, Shakespeare and the Greeks to Sam Shepard, uh, and also saw Chinese plays, uh, some of which featured foreign characters on stage. Uh, and it was troubling to me to see how foreigners were being presented on the Chinese stage. I hadn't been, I wasn't accustomed to uh, seeing Caucasian and African-American and other ethnicities uh, played by Chinese actors um, uh, presenting as foreign. So uh, I was, I would say I had a range of emotions, sometimes offended, sometimes amused, uh, sometimes just intrigued. And so I decided to write my dissertation about this topic of how the foreigner is represented on the Chinese stage. And that, um, that dissertation became this book, Significant Other Staging the American in China. So if you're interested to read more about that topic, um, you can look at that book. And then I wanted to point out the cover of this book uh, shows a play called uh, Dignity, Zunian, uh, that Sha Yashin, a very prominent playwright, wrote in 1997. It was directed by Yu Luosheng. And this was only the second play in China to have foreign actors playing foreign characters on the Chinese stage. The first was Student Wife by the, the same director, different playwright. Um, and so they had two casts for this production. The original cast was made up of foreign students and expats working in China. And the cast represented six different countries, um, Canada, Romania, 
the Congo, Guinea, um, lots of different parts of the world. And um, then they did the original production in Shanghai, toured to Beijing, but then they had another maybe month of performances in Shanghai and all the foreigners had to go back to school and back to their jobs. So they recast it using Chinese actors in the more conventional uh, makeup. And so the, the, the cover of my book is this uh, multi-ethnic jury at a trial in the story. And this is the second cast, the Chinese actors playing the roles. Um, the story is taken from real life. Uh, Shai Yishin read, read a newspaper story about an, a Chinese woman who was living in the United States and was treated abusively by her um, white American um, employer and her son and uh, eventually takes them to court to reclaim her dignity. That's where the title of the play comes from. So it's during a kind of anti-American period in China and a nationalistic uh, sentiment where the sympathy is with the Chinese person who's suffering in the United States. So I'm gonna go now to, this is the list of productions I'm gonna to touch on this evening and I'll go through them you know, rather quickly. But uh, first I'm going to present to you uh, several variations of Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and Uncle Tom's Cabin, as Keisha mentioned, was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1852. And it was, um, quote, translated by Lin Shu, who did not speak English. He would work with a partner who would read the book and tell him what's going on, and then he would write it in Chinese. Uh, but it was not adapted from the George Aiken play of 1852, the stage version. It was adapted from the novel, Lin Shu's, uh, uh, Lin Shu's translation of the novel. And so the first production you're gonna see is by Chinese foreign students living in Tokyo. These are college age students who come back to China as kind of the new intellectuals during the new culture movement who are promoting the vernacular in literature and on stage and kind of um, promoting this new form of theater in China that's being borrowed from the West but imported via Tokyo, which via Japan, which is important. And then there's another version done in Shanghai that's not connected to the one that was done in Japan. And that's actually not in the, the Western spoken drama form. It's done to ping tan music, which is a more traditional Chinese form. And then in 1958, for the 50th anniversary of the play and also of the founding of, of this Western style spoken drama in China, it is restaged um, with an adaptation written by Ouyang Yuchen, who was one of the actors that was in the Tokyo production as a student. Um, and then in 2007, for the 100th anniversary of spoken drama and the 100th anniversary of the play, uh, Nick uh, Yu, Yu Rongjun, creates um, a kind of hybrid form that I'll explain when I get to the images. So this play clearly has a very rich history in, the United, in, in China, and you're going to see different ways that race and blackness, both blackness and whiteness are represented in the play. Then I'm going to tell you about the passages of Martin Luther King, a play by Claiborne Carson, who's a professor at Stanford and is the um, chosen scholar by uh, Coretta Scott King of the Martin Luther King papers. So he has archived the papers, he's written the authoritative um, biography of Martin Luther King and is a really wonderful scholar and person. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about the most recent production that um, staged Black characters on stage, the African-American play A Raisin in the Sun, which is a great American classic of the theater, not just an African-American classic, but a classic of all, all American theater. Um, and it's the very first time that the play has been staged in China. So this is the poster or playbill from the 1907 production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And since you're poster house, I wanted to include as many images of posters in my presentation as I could. Um, so this is what the audience members in 1907 actually received when they went to the performance. And it's depicting the scene uh, where George Harris is fleeing with uh, his wife, Eliza, and their son, Harry, and he's being pursued and is fighting off um, the, the uh, pursuers who are trying to stop him from uh, fleeing. And he shoots Tom Loker, one of the, um, one of the white um, villains of the play who's pursuing him. And this is the same image in the production as you just saw on the poster. Um, 
One thing that's really important to point out is it's very interesting that the very first full production of a Chinese spoken drama, and so when I say spoken drama, I'm contrasting that with the theater tradition in China up until the 20th century, which was classical opera that was done in classical Chinese with local music forms and was sung and spoken in many different dialects. So this is the first time you have theater that's performed in the vernacular, the kind of language that people spoke in real life. Um, and Uncle Tom's Cabin was chosen because the Chinese at the time were identifying with the oppression of um, enslaved peoples in the United States. And they were identifying for two reasons. Uh, it was the waning years of the Qing dynasty, which is a Manchu dynasty. Uh, where the Manchus came in from the north and were ruling China since 1644. And it was also the period of the Chinese Exclusion Act in the United States, when Chinese who had immigrated to the United States were being um, mistreated, discriminated against in the US. So Uncle Tom's Cabin is kind of depicting the, the white imperialist as the villain and the um, sympathetic characters, of course, are the enslaved people and the Chinese um, intellectuals are identifying with that suffering and it's a sympathetic portrayal. So this is another photograph from the same production. From right to left is Tom, Eliza, Chloe, Tom's wife, and little Harry, Eliza's son. And what I want you to notice in terms of the aesthetics of costume and makeup is that there's a, a Western style costume being adopted. And again, remember that this is a production in Tokyo at a university and the director is actually a Japanese professor, but the actors are all male Chinese students playing both the male and female roles. Um, but also there's still some traces of influence from Japanese traditional theater, specifically Kabuki. So if you look at Chloe second from the left, from the facial makeup and from the wig, it's, it's somewhat based on a, a traditional Japanese look blended or fused with a Western Caucasian look. Um, so it's not fully naturalistic or realistic um, representation or an attempt at that yet. But when we get to the next production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, 50 years later, there's a tradition of Chinese makeup that's developed that in Chinese is called which means realistic makeup. And so there is pigmentation, wigs, sometimes prosthetic nose or chin, um, and also costume and style of acting are all brought together to attempt to present um, a, a verisimilitude, a, a realistic depiction of the ethnicity, race, nationality of the characters that are being depicted. And so here you see Tom and Chloe with their three children, um, Mose, Peter, and I think the baby girl is unnamed in the novel. I can't remember her having a name, but anyway, this is a very intimate domestic moment of um, joy among their own family. It's not one of the moments um, when the villain is oppressing them. It's kind of showing their integrity as a family. And again, in a large proscenium theater for a Chinese audience, this is a very realistic uh, representation. Whereas for us, for whoever, you know, you may be Chinese, Latinx, black, white, you may be looking at these representations and thinking that doesn't look realistic to me. And so I think there's gonna be a dissonance between um, racial representations that we're accustomed to or that we also have called into question from early periods of vaudeville and minstrelsy and other forms of American theater, maybe Hollywood of the mid 20th century that used yellow face and black face. Um, and what the Chinese audience, which is a, a, a largely monoracial nation where they don't have an acting pool of um, non-Chinese actors to draw from, that they wanna tell these stories and be as true to the representations as possible. And so I think one of the things would be interesting to discuss, and I'm, I'm very curious what the attendees who came tonight are thinking is how do you receive these images? Um, how do they seem to you? And then when you reflect on your own um, spectator practices and historical backgrounds or performance traditions, 
versus how a Chinese audience of this time and then as we jump forward may be receiving these images. I think it's really worthwhile to discuss that. And I think we can raise more questions than we can answer, but it's really important to think about these questions. So this is from the same production. And this is um, a very famous image in all versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin in the United States, whether they're stage or film. This is Topsy and little Eva, Topsy and Eva, who had a very, very close friendship. And um, if, you, if you look up later after the presentation, American versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin on stage and film, particularly the Duncan sisters film, silent film, uh, you'll see that Topsy is usually portrayed in a, a minstrel type of character. She is um, kind of over the top. She, it's a ra very ha highly racialized figure. She stands out from the other black um, people in the play where she's being, she's almost always performing as a minstrel and confused or saying something funny or being hysterical or being afraid, very animated. And here in the um, Chinese production, you feel a difference because there's a sympathetic feel towards something she's experiencing. Again, it's an intimate moment with her and Eva. And then you also have this juxtaposition of this quote, realistic makeup um, convention with uh, a black American character and a white American character. And so again, for the, for the makeup artists, this is considered, um, a very advanced skill to be able to uh, present the characters this way uh, on stage. This Now we jump ahead to 2007, and this is Nick Yu's um, juxtaposition of scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin from the original production in 1907, um, and scenes from the last hundred years of the history of the development of spoken drama in China. And so 10 of the most important dramatists from China, beginning with Li Shutong, up through uh, Huang Zolin and Zhao Zhuyin are played by actors and it's interspersed with scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin that kind of reflect on what the Chinese uh, 20th century intellectuals are going through. So again, there's an identification of the oppression of enslaved people in the United States of, of the earlier period with the oppression of intellectuals um, in Chinese society in the 20th century. One, an interesting thing to notice in both these photographs is that everybody's wearing a corsage. So if you have a red carnation on, you are an African-American character, you're black. If you have a white carnation, you're white. And if you have, as you see in the two gentlemen standing here, um, a different kind of flower or green, just kind of green leaf, you are Chinese. And so here's an example of a scene from Uncle Tom's Cabin vignettes where you have Legree, Skeggs and Haley and they all have the white carnation. And then on the right, you have a scene with Eliza and Tom and they're marked, the race is marked only by the red carnation. And so I'm curious to know from those of you attending, how does it feel to see re race represented this way, a more experimental way without the racial markers of wigs and makeup versus the earlier ways. And here is uh, Pu Sunxian, very famous actor who's, who's uh, just speaking and Li Shutong who also functions kind of as the narrator. And on the right is little George Shelby with the white carnation and Tom. Now we're jumping, uh, not jumping, we're in 2007. We're staying in 2007, the same year as the, um, and also I should mention that, that Nick's production was a big production in the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square. It was only a one night performance at the end of a big festival celebrating the centennial of spoken drama in China. And the script was given to the actors in pieces, and then they all came together to perform it. And there's actually some quite daring social commentary that happens in the juxtaposition of the scenes um, that took some risks. And so it was, uh, in terms of censors, it may not have been able to be performed. And I can comment on that later in the Q&A, if you wish. So if it had done a normal run in a regular theater, it may not have um, gone past one performance. But since it's a one night only, it got through. So this is Claiborne Carson, who I mentioned earlier on the left, and he's standing in front of a very huge poster advertising uh, the pass passages of Martin Luther King, the international premiere in Beijing at the um, uh, Dongfang Xianfang Juchang, which is the Dongfang Xianfang Juchang. Xianfang can be avant-garde, but sometimes it's translated as pioneer. So it's called the Oriental Pioneer Theater. It's a large venue. 
On the left is the playbill from the international premiere, the opening night. And on the right is a scene from the play where you have uh, the Chinese actor playing Martin Luther King and preaching. These are images from the playbill also. And here is the same photograph that you see here in the playbill uh, staged live. And this is at the end of the performance when they join hands and sing, we shall overcome. As you can see, there are three African-American performers. These were gospel singers that were brought from the United States to Beijing to participate in the production to sing the gospel songs. It has a gospel score of songs. And then interspersed between them are the Chinese actors who just played the roles uh, in the play. Um, and they're all playing, uh, not all playing, three of them are playing African-American roles and one of them is playing a white role. So from right to left is the actor playing Daddy King, Martin Luther King's father. Next to him is the actor that played John F. Kennedy. Then one of the gospel singers in the center, the actor playing Martin Luther King. If you, if you, the next gospel singer, and then you have the actor who's playing Stokey Carmichael. Uh, next to him is J. Edgar Hoover. So I'm sorry, two white characters and three African American characters, and then the gospel singer. So again, you don't have um, racially marked pigment of the skin for the Chinese actors. So you have um, people representing black roles that are both black and Chinese. This is a scene with uh, protests and this is right before Martin Luther King is arrested. And here the gospel singers join as they had some small roles in the play and a few lines in Chinese, but mostly non-speaking parts. This is, um, this is a really interesting slide because you have um, King in the prison in Birmingham in 1963. And then on the right, you have um, Coretta Scott King in the center receiving a phone call from John F. Kennedy. And it's a very famous phone call where he expresses sympathy for King being in jail. And then subsequent to that, he and Bobby Kennedy um, make other calls and negotiations to get King released from jail. But what's interesting is if you, and I'm gonna show another slide next, look on the right first. This is that same scene. You have Daddy King on the left, Alberta Williams King in the center, and then you have um, Coretta Scott King on the right. But these wigs are actually usually used to mark whiteness in Chinese plays. This, if you just saw this still from a Chinese play, you would assume that this is a foreign play or it's a Chinese play with white foreigners in it because they're actually wigged and costumed um, in a way that reads white for Chinese audience members. Um, but in this case, they're playing black characters. On the left is when um, Martin Luther King is dancing with Coretta when they're younger. And um, it's kind of a joyful scene in the play. But it's interesting to see the contrast of how the African-American characters are being played on the left without wigs and then on the right with wigs. Now we're going to this past year, 2020, September 1st, 2020, with the premiere of A Raisin in the Sun. And on the left is the poster that was used um, eventually. This was the last version of the poster. On the right is a photograph of the script. So on the left, those of you who are from China or spend time in China can see that it's a cartoon of Ying Da on the top of the poster. He directed the play. He's not usually a, play, a theater director. He is a film director a talk show host, a very famous actor of film, uh, but perhaps he's most famous for being China's sitcom king. He created the very first sitcom in China, Wo Ai Wo Jia, I Love My Home, and many subsequent sitcoms. So he's very well known for that and his brand is about comedy. And you can see that reflected in the cartoon figure of him and you'll see it even more in the other posters. The reason I'm showing the script is that it's Ying Da's mother, Wu Shiliang, who translated A Raisin in the Sun in 1963, four years after it premiered in the United States, and the script kind of disappeared. So Ying Da didn't know that his mother had translated this play. And then in 2019, 2020, he received a phone call from a friend who said, hey, Ying Da, there's something up for auction with your mother's name on it, a document, something she wrote, something she translated. So he gave the information to Ying Da and Ying Da purchased the script. And he felt that it was kind of meant to be that his late mother's script has somehow found him. And he said, I have to stage this. 
what he didn't know also was that his father, Ying Warcheng, had always wanted to stage A Raisin in the Sun. So Wu Shiliang's husband, who was a famous actor, director, and translator in his own right. And uh, when he talked to me about this in the 90s, that he, wanted to, he had always wanted to stage A Raisin in the Sun, he said he never did it because he couldn't really reconcile how to present the African-American family on stage in a realistic manner um, that would be sensitive to an American audience as well as a Chinese audience. So these are two posters. On the left is a poster that Ying Da started to use before he changed it to the one on the right. And we were in touch because he had asked me to write the introduction to the publication of the Chinese version of A Raisin in the Sun, which was going to be published at the same time that the play was premiering. And so when he showed me the poster, I was very concerned and I told him that the iconography on the poster and the interpretation of him being a puppeteer with these um, African American characters on strings and the kind of cartoonishness of what we consider a rather serious play um, was off putting to me I was unsettled by it and I asked him to really think about whether he wanted to use it and then he sent me this other version and, and it was that like the, they were already being printed so these other posters did they're on the internet and stuff, but I think for the theater, they used the poster on the right. Um, so I'm interested to know, you know, what other people think about that. And then this was a version that I found on the internet that Ying Da didn't show to me, where it's kind of full on cartoon representation. So it's probably an earlier version before the one I just showed you. Um, and it comes from an article that's talking about, you know, using this Ying Da comedy style to present a serious play. So again, Ying Da is really known for his comic style. You can see this in the way that um, he directed the play. So there are many more kind of lighter scenes or forced comedy than we know from the original play. And here you can also see um, that they just he decided not to use realistic makeup, but to use a kind of bronzing to hint at the fact that they're African American and kind of suggest it. Uh, and so I'm curious how this reads to you as you see the images. Uh, this slide I'm showing you so that you can see Lindner, which is the one Caucasian character in the play who's looking somewhat like Donald Trump <laughs> in this image. Um, and that's uh, and Travis. In this photograph, it's uh, Walter Lee, Lena, Travis, um, Benita, and Ruth. And then here's just a close up of one of the actors doing the, the bronzing and one of the wig makers making one of the um, African-American wig. This is just the cast with Ying Da in their clothes today, young, um, and just so you can get a sense of what they look like off stage. And then finally, this is the set design and they projected the Langston Hughes poem, um, Harlem, Dream Deferred, above the set at the beginning of the play in Chinese. And for the poster house, this is um, one of, uh, this is in the lobby of the Senium Theater, the Beijing People's Art Theater. And this is one of the audience members having her pick in with the poster, maybe before the play, after the play or intermission. And this is a very common custom in China. There's always these huge posters in the lobby and people being photographed. So to close, I just wanna show you that there are some other productions, Dignity I, I spoke about, Fences in 1996, very significant production that was approved by August Wilson in spite of his um, preferences that his plays uh, be directed only by African-Americans and performed by African-Americans. This was directed by a white director, Meg Booker, and uh, was actors, Chinese actors from the Beijing People's Art Theater. And A Soldier's Play in 1992, which was just revived on Broadway last year, was directed at Shanghai Theater Academy, Body and Soul, which is actually an adaptation of the film Body and Soul, which is connected to Clifford Odette's play, Golden Boy, but not a straight adaptation. And then in 1965, a very influential play, War Drum the Equator, about the Congo crisis. So if you wanna learn about any of those plays, you can contact me or Google. And then I had given, I think Mike has a link to a very short NPR piece, but a good piece that was done on Raising the Sun back in September. And then finally, I just want to thank these people and all of you who are here, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just so we make sure we have time for a QA, we're going to jump right to Faye. Um, so, Faye Chiu Lu is a PhD student at UCLA. 
whose research focuses on modern Chinese film literature and media culture. So thank you, Faye, for joining us. Thank you, Michael. And uh, yeah, thank you for, you know, the wonderful presentations by Claire and Akisha. Yeah, like Michael mentioned, you know, I'm a grad student at UCLA working on Asian languages and cultures, particularly, you know, Chinese and Sinophone literature and popular culture from the 1950s to the 1980s. And uh, yeah, I want to say, you know, thank everybody for, you know, joining us wherever you are tonight this afternoon or this morning. And uh, I feel really excited and uh, humbled as well to you know, talk about, share this more like a thinking piece yeah, not really like uh, you know, work that's done uh, with you guys and, uh, you know, and uh, kind of talk about you know, what uh, I've been thinking about. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, does this look okay? Okay, good. Okay, so I guess a little bit about myself. So originally I'm from uh, Nanjing in China and uh, I, I know there's an upcoming exhibition called The Sleeping Giant, something Chinese economy, right? At Poster House. And as someone who grew up in the 1990s in a Chinese city, you know, we really sort of stood on the shoulder of that giant that's waking up, you know, and uh, everything was changing very fast, like the marketization, urbanization, and a lot of movement of people. Um, and, uh, so I think, you know, at the same time as the growing sense of globalization, there's also, I also observe, you know, an increasing sense of nationalistic sentiment, you know, among a lot of young people like me who are educated in uh, the quote unquote Western system and who sort of travel a lot and who, you know, have been living abroad uh, for a long time. And, but for, for me, I, you know, after college, I stayed uh, in the States and then my family immigrated and I do all this grad work. So I think I kind of have this privilege, you know, to think through a lot of uh, these questions from history, from culture, from all these sort of materials. But I also kind of wanna take, you know, the standpoint of uh, a, a young person and kind of think of, you know, what I call, uh, you know, kind of relating to one another, right, in this uh, very rapidly changing world. Because for myself, uh, you know, uh, thoughts and the writings on Blackness had always been a source of uh, inspiration and a frame of reference for me to think of uh, Chineseness. Uh, you know, um, you know, from thinkers such as Frantz Fanon and Amy Césaire and the Sangor up until a later period like uh, Glissant. Uh, you know, I, I kind of also work my idea from th about Chineseness through uh, these thinkers, you know, evolution of thinking about Blackness such as from a reactive sort of uh, category of civilized or cultural, you know, term to something more open, something more opaque and, uh, you know, more uh, creolized uh, sort of, you know, and uh, to be more open to interaction with, uh, you know, everyone. So, all right. So now, yeah, I guess I'm going to switch gears to Chinese popular music, in particular underground hip hop. And uh, I want to mention that, you know, the examples I look at here would feature all Chinese artists and no black artists. But instead of quickly dismissing their performativity and appropriation of black culture, you know, I want to read into the ways in which these performers are finding connections to black experiences in their creation. And that's why the title here is relating to blackness. So first, what I show here is a, a commercial for the internet reality show called The Rap of China or Zhongguo Ha" that first streamed in the summer of 2017. 
In the show, rappers from all corners of China, including a few Chinese Americans, uh, have their performances judged by four experienced uh, celebrities, and then they compete with each other. Uh, it not only took the country by storm with its immense popularity, but also showcased a very diverse body of underground hip hop artists. But actually, hip hop culture uh, had been developing different areas of China since the 90s. But many people didn't know, you know, until they watched the show. So although the rap of China has got mixed reception, uh, not to mention the censorship of hip hop on Chinese TV after the first season, I want to look at two music labels that had appeared on the show, but rather focus more on the origin and development of their style and uh, the relevance of these uh, styles to our topic today. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, the style called uh, C trap, meaning Chinese trap, right, which is developed in Chongqing, uh, a city uh, in the southwest of China. And trap is a subgenre of rap that origina uh, originated in the southern city of Atlanta in the United States. And the name came from the slang trap used for talking about illegal drug markets. But then, you know, some uh, many critics uh, also think this can be extended to talking about the trap of a new liberal economy and uh, the fight for social mobility. So in 2015, Udu Montana, which you see here uh, in this picture, a hip hop artist uh, based in Chongqing, who has attended college in Michigan, was uh, inspired to create the first trap album in Chinese uh, titled, This is Wu Du. And Wu Du literally means a uh, foggy city. And the success of his album led Udu Matana to establish the independent label called Gash Music, which specialized in C trap. And the fans also begin to call the city of Chongqing by the name Chongte Landa, Okay, which is a combination of Chongqing and Atlanta. Uh, so now I want, want us to listen to uh, a little bit of his song here uh, in 2015 called Wu Du Night Talk. documentary with Noisy in 2017, Udu Montana said that when he first made this song, he desired to express in what he grew up seeing from the 1990s until then. He wanted to create authentic trap with Chinese and to talk about things in China that are similar to outside the country. And we can see here, you know, in my partially and maybe poorly translated lyrics, Udu Montana has very specific focuses in his song. Yeah, he starts by zooming in to this one neighborhood called Xiaolongkan, which he calls his hood. And then he goes on to rap about things like prostitution, nightclub, uh, growing materialism, and also the feeling of disorientation in that world. And Cheryl Keys, a professor at UCLA, uh, and uh, also one of the pioneers in hip hop studies, had written that street production is a more important feature than urban culture in African-American rap. And Udu Montana's focus on Xiaolongkan and emphasis on the realness of his lyrics kind of 
resonates with this ghetto music tradition. And the usage of Chongqing dialect in the song, which is different from Mandarin Chinese, may also uh, be comparable to the non-standard uh, black street speech that's uh, often used in African-American rap. But at the same time, I also wonder you know, if my comparison is really appropriate because no matter if it's the earlier African-American old school rap or the more recent trap rap, their style and subjects all derive from a racialized experience of navigating the American and the global economy. So when these rap productions are compared at a global level, some historical differences and negative stereotypes might become more reinforced while overlooking the transnational bonds by over certain phenomena and the cuisine. So that's also something I, I want to uh, leave you to think about. And now uh, I want to turn to another music label called Sub Music or SUP Music based in Changsha, which is the capital of Hunan province. And the producer of the label Xiao Qidao is originally from Hong Kong and later studied in the US and then went to Changsha to work on music. He and the group under his label called C Block had developed their Jianghu style rap. And Jianghu, right, uh, which is a, probably a term very familiar to Chinese speakers, literally means the rivers and lakes. It's a term commonly used in Chinese uh, martial arts fictions and films to describe the fantasy world of outlaws from all corners, marginalized by the official society. And uh, yeah, without saying much about their style, I think I'm just going to show you a little of their song in the 2017 called The Flow of Jianghu here. <laughs> Um, so as you can see, uh, many people, you know, who who uh, listen to their music actually are talking about their the native Chinese style of their Jianghu flow. Uh, although I, you know, as you can see, uh, they combine sort of the old school boom bap rap, right, with sort of the lyrical tradition of. Uh, Chinese music and Chinese poetry. At the same time, you know, there are a lot of visual symbols are very local, uh, localized styles, such as, you know, the space of the river and their use of a uh, natural landscape. And uh, their fashion is kind of also a hybrid style, you know, such as, you know, this um, 
combination of a bandana headband and a sort of chewing a straw uh, in their uh, in the mouth, you know, kind of both a hip hop star and uh, a Chinese sort of martial arts sword man, right? But um, I also want to bring attention to the history of transnational cultural flow that had influenced the formation of their uh, current style. Because tribute to martial arts film culture in Hong Kong in the 1970s can be found in the design of their logo, which is you know, on the right hand side here, uh, which looks very similar to the left hand side, which is the logo of the Golden Harvest Film Studio, uh, which was founded in 1970. And the Golden Harvest had produced and distributed many martial arts films in Hong Kong and worldwide. As some of you may know, these films were often shown in theaters in American cities during the 1970s and 1980s and were especially popular among the African American communities. And some also link it to the genre called black exploitation uh, uh, during that time, right? Because uh, at the time when much of the middle class population had moved to the suburbs and the people of color sort of became more concentrated in the cities, these low budget films often attract viewers with certain certain plots such as you know, uh, black heroes fighting against racist suppression. And martial arts cinema from Hong Kong kind of had a similar appeal among African-American audience because it's full of action. Uh, there's often a non-white hero and many of them were produced uh, in the actual you know, colonial atmosphere under British rule of the time when uh, many migrant uh, Chinese worked hard to sell the, their body and labor for their individual success in the booming economy of Hong Kong. So there's also that Afro-Asian cultural connection uh, in that cultural, uh, in that, uh, you know, uh, transnational flow of culture. And here uh, you see the poster for the 1970 film, Enter the Dragon, co-produced by uh, Golden Harvest and uh, America's Warner Brothers, starring Bruce Lee, John Saxon, and Jim Kelly, who is the first black martial artist actor. And uh, also, you know, uh, on the right, New York hip hop legend Wu-Tang Clan also found inspirations uh, in that, you know, film and comic culture uh, from Hong Kong. For example, their album in 1993 called uh, Enter the 36th Chamber uh, took the name from two Hong Kong films in the 70s and combined them together. Right? And one of those films is Enter the Dragon you see here, and the other one is called The 36th Chamber of Shaolin, produced by another uh, studio based in Hong Kong called the Shaw Brothers. So now we kind of go back to the song Jianghu Flow, right? Produced in the middle of China's booming economy at this moment, and many hardships also faced by common people. Right? Their style def definitely inherits the themes of life struggles and emphasis on the kind of brotherhood, right? In both Hong Kong martial arts films and African American hip hop from 1970s to the uh, to the 90s. So at a time when underground Chinese hip hop go mainstream and the music in the industry becomes more and more globalized, reality shows like the rap of China and international tours of these artists are able to gain broader audience and have more global exchanges. But they also face the challenge of national cultural representation of or following the correct political lines right, along with their increased visibility. And at the same time, under the current cultural policy uh, in China, right, that try to encourage the so-called positive energy uh, and avoid depictions of the dark side of society, the realness of hip hop can get censored and lost. And very importantly, it could miss the transnational relations and empowerment in hip hop culture, like thinking about the trap or tribute to solidarity among minor cultures, uh, as in my examples. And lastly, right, following another wave of Black Lives Matter protests last year, many people started to question right, why most Chinese hip hop stars are staying silent on this issue. Uh, again, the answer may not be very straightforward. Um, so I wanna 
and right, my thinking in progress uh, by inviting everyone to reflect on this question, which is when nationalist sentiment right, is easily evoked in the age of globalization and the solidarity right, is sometimes not uh, expressed in the conventional way, as we know, then how can listeners like us take the initiative to problematize the so-called Chineseness in Chinese hip hop and develop transnational relations in racial and cultural identities? Okay, and that's it. Um, thank you so much for all of your wonderful presentations. They are so provocative and generous and um, and really helpful for us to kind of untangle uh, untangle a lot of these complex um, cultural phenomenons. And so now we're going to open it up for question and answers. And I want to remind the audience that if you have a question, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A box. We'll be selecting some of them anonymously to the panelists. Um, so. The first question is for Keisha. Um, do you happen to know have uh, Do you happen to have a population figures or rough percentage of the number of uh, people from the African diaspora currently living in China? And maybe you can also share more about like who are these communities? You know, we have the you know people from Africa. There's also African American community or from the globe. And what are some of the kind of the cultural proximities of these communities in China? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to put a link in the chat to a, um, a study that came out that kind of links um, and lists the history of trying to um, really get a sense of the numbers of the population. And I like this particular study because it lists the kind of four uh, major categories of people who are coming to China. Um, you have one which are kind of diplomats or official representatives of uh, different countries. So they're coming in terms of the diplomatic or representing their nation state um, to China. You have students and trainees who might be coming for either short term, so coming for school or training for a particular program and then leaving, or some who come for a longer term in China. So this kind of second category. Um, a third category is professionals who work for multinational corporations or international organizations and their work brings them to China for either again, sometimes short term or sometimes long term, depending on the project that they're working on with these companies or these organizations. So thinking about, you know, multinational corporations that have uh, uh, offices all over the world in multiple nations or international organizations that are trying to do a lot of work in different places as well. And then the last is kind of sometimes people who are, um, I'm straighter or small businesses who might come to say they want to come in and teach English or some of those other set up a business and do some work, um, do certain things in China as well. And so I like this particular piece because it kind of breaks down kind of these different categories of who's coming, um, but also kind of goes through it and gives a history of trying to get demographic records, how it was started on like an individual level, and then how the research is kind of expanding since then, trying to get a sense of the numbers. And so there's not a whole number, I don't have a complete number for you, um, but one of the rough estimates kind of pre-COVID when we saw kind of a uh, kind of the backlash was we saw about 100,000 to 200,000 uh, in different parts of China, with many being in southern China, um, particularly in Guangzhou, where there is one of the, the largest um, one of the largest um, particular uh, spaces uh, where you have a huge community of people who have African and African American descent. Um, when it comes to uh, the different uh, numbers in terms of the different groups. Um, I think in many cases, it's less African-Americans who are going to China and more people who are from uh, the different nations in Africa where they have uh, different collaboration or their, con their countries have connections to the Chinese government through uh, the FOCOC, which is the form on uh, Chinese and African cooperation where they're building those ties and connections, which is leading to projects across um, uh, multiple kind of transnational projects across different places where they include a, a multitude of nations. and so. They're building those particular areas as well. Um, this uh, this uh, particular particular um. Sorry, this particular uh, panel, this uh, research also kind of shows the number of students who are coming who are getting scholarships from the Chinese government. So really trying to show the richness of the different people who are coming and why they're coming and how those numbers are being produced and what does that look like. Um, but unfortunately, I think because of some of the incidents that happened last April um, with the kind of uh, kind of rise of, of the kind of backlash, there are some numbers where people are projecting that they will go down um, only because of some ways in which the idea is that one, um, they're not uh, have the protection of the Chinese nation state because 
they're not citizens. And two, um, in many cases, is the China dream their dream as well? So we're talking about the building this China dream. Can they see themselves being part of that? And is it a safe space for them to be in China anymore? And so those are some questions that they're trying to think through. Um, but I think those are some of the ways in which the numbers have been, um, in some ways, uh, understood. And also some ways that people are trying to uh, kind of get an estimate on who is there and how that might be changing uh, since uh, since uh, the COVID pandemic has um, in some ways broken out. Hope it answered your question. I'm not sure if it answered all of it, um, but there are a lot of different resources and sites, uh, one of which is Black Liberty China, uh, which is um, one established by uh, different individuals who are of the uh, Black diaspora. So it's not just uh, Africa, it's also people from the Caribbean, the United States, from Europe as well, who are all coming, um, who are coming to China for a variety of reasons. And it's a website that is dedicated to uh, amplifying those voices in that space. So they are talking about what it means to be Black in China, and you can hear a diversity of voices talking about their experience coming there as well. And so I think that's another website that goes beyond the numbers to give you a kind of everyday picture of how people are navigating China, um, how they're building communities, how they're doing events and cultural events to connect with the Chinese community. I think then uh, there's one event they have every year um, called uh, kind of the China Africa Day. And they try to bring out and really engage with the community to say, you know, we are some ways your neighbors here. Uh, come and learn about the cultures of these people and places. And so um, those are just some places that can give you information about the demographics, but also kind of the cultural, um, the way in which the people are living and understanding and living their everyday life and give you some two different dimensions from that particular experience. Okay, thanks a lot, Keisha. Um, the next question is for Claire. Did the producers, directors, and production designers on any of these productions uh, consult any sources or resources to inform their depiction of Black characters? or, or the depiction solely the result of their perception of the individuals who produce these plays? Hi, so yes, um, thank you for all the good questions in the Q&A. And I'm just gonna try to give a very um, concise response that embraces several of them. So um, at different periods in time, uh, Chinese had different access to foreigners, to being abroad or to foreign materials. So for example, in, 19, in 1958, 61, when they're doing the second Uncle Tom's Cabin, this is in the period of New China and the Cultural Revolution. So it's going from you know, early Maoist China up to the Cultural Revolution. And there is not um, access to foreigners, to translated materials. It's very difficult to get um, that kind of interaction. Um, but if you look at, for example, um, someone asked if, if, um, if African-Americans were involved in some of the productions. So for the MLK play, Claiborne Carson was involved, the playwright, and he um, was being consulted. Um, but also what's important is that um, Stanford brought members of the National Theater Company of China that did the production. So the head of the theater, the director, the adapter of the script, and a few others to the United States before staging the production. And they visited Memphis, they visited Georgia, they went to museums. They met um, actually with someone who was with King when he was assassinated. Um, they watched a video, they were in archives. Um, there was a lot of history and a lot of time for reflection and questions. Um, there were a lot of cultural misunderstandings in that project because some of the things that they wanted to emphasize or that they found interesting in the story or in King Martin Luther King as, as a person, as a historical figure, were different from how um, the uh, people that were involved on the other side of the production, especially Katrine McKiernan, who kind of spearheaded, produced uh, the production in China, how she really wanted King to be portrayed. So there's a whole second story about cross-cultural collaborations in theater and, um, you know, the Americans wanting to have more say, the Chinese wanting to have more say that goes beyond race. It also has to do with cultural understanding and theater, but also um, for Raisin in the Sun, I, yeah, it's, it's hard to cover everything, but Yingda, um, I was not collaborating on the production or involved in the production. I was asked to write the introduction for the publication of the script in China. But because I know Yingda well and the family well, one of the reasons he wanted me to write the introduction was because I knew his father so well and you know, he wanted me to write about his mother as the translator. I helped his father write his autobiography. So um, I immediately put him in touch with Harvey Young, who was one of the leading scholars of African-American theater and um, encouraged Yingda and Harvey 
to talk because I said to Yingda, you know, I, you really should have um, an African-American collaborator or consultant or advisor, you know, and I explained to him, I said, you know, it's 2020, it's Black Lives Matter. I, I found that what he was doing with the play was problematic. So I hope that came through in my presentation, but I really struggled with it. And since I'm not African-American, I told, you know, he's like, well, you, you know, you tell me what you think. And I said, yeah, but I'm not black. I'm not African-American. And I'm also not an expert in African-American theater. And this person is, I, you know, I do a certain thing that I do in Chinese theater and Asian American theater and cross-cultural collaborations. So in that aspect, I, I had some views, but um, not from the point of view of how blackness should be presented or how, how people would feel. I did remind him he has an international audience, not just a Chinese audience, because usually directors will talk about what they think the Chinese audience wants. And he said, they're gonna be confused if they don't have makeup. They're gonna be confused if they don't have wigs. And I told him I didn't necessarily agree with that, but I also can't tell the director you know, how to do the play. So Harvey raised a really interesting question when he talked to me and when he talked to Yingda. Um, he, he was open to different approaches to the play. And he said, you know, what does this mean if, um, I wanna think how to phrase it because I'm paraphrasing Harvey. The main question he asked is, and it's in the NPR interview too. What does it mean when a play becomes part of the canon? A Raisin in the Sun is part of the American canon and also the international canon, right? So when a play achieves that kind of canonicity, how do you do it in the examples Harvey gave where how do you do it in Brazil? How do you stage it in Brazil? How do you stage it in China? How do you stage it all over the world? And I think that's a question we should discuss because as you saw in my presentation, I tried to show you lots of different approaches that Chinese have taken ranging from you know, what they considered to look realistic, although I may not and we may not, to using an abstract form like the carnations, to using no makeup and having Chinese actors playing African-Americans alongside African-Americans, and then to Yingda trying to find this in between with, with the bronzing, right? So I'm trying to present all those different approaches. The Yu Luo Sheng, who directed Dignity and Student Wife, there are debates in China. He felt very strongly, and this was in the mid 90s, He's like, the time has come and gone for Chinese actors to play foreigners. Foreigners need to play themselves. It, it, that practice is offensive. It's gone by the wayside. And so when I talked to him, he felt very strongly about it. When I talked to Xu Chengxian, who was one of the actors that was in the cast, playing alongside the multinational foreigner cast, he expressed frustration because he said, you know, these actors don't really speak very good Chinese and they don't have acting training. We're just plucking these foreigners because there really isn't, um, there is not a community yet in China of trained actors who would be professional level actors who also speak fluent Chinese at the level that you would want to be in a play. Um, in the US, of course, we have so many gifted actors of different ethnicities who don't get enough work by far. And we still have issues with stereotyping in our cultural productions. Um, but we, we can cast Black people to play Black characters and Asian people to play Asian characters and so on. Um, China, it's debatable whether, whether that is something that can and should be done, but there's certainly people who feel strongly on both sides of it. So there's sometimes frustration in acting with foreign actors and then some actors have really liked working with foreign actors and said, it's, it's more real to me when I'm acting with a real foreigner in this play. So it's a really complex issue. It's, it's hard to boil it down in a short presentation, but I hope that those insights might help a little bit. And it isn't, it, it's, a, it's an active discussion in China, which I think is a good thing. And it, and it should be a global discussion. I did say to Yingda, it's an international audience. You know, you're very famous. You're gonna get attention for this play. It's being covered on NPR. Uh, you know, you should be thinking about a global audience and not just a Chinese audience. And you should also be thinking of, you know, not thinking of the Chinese audience as a monolithic audience that doesn't have different tastes or that you as the director aren't making a decision about how these roles should be played and presented and you know, be ready to answer for those choices. So um, I hope that helps. Thanks. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. So next one is for Faye. Um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the framework of quote, relating to blackness, unquote, as opposed to cultural appropriation of black music, culture, cultural symbols, et cetera. What is the distinction? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, yeah, I think that's a, 
Yeah, great question. And uh, I think I could have made it clearer. I, I think for me, relating to blackness is uh, not, you know, the the performativity or the commodity of the hip hop um, song that uh, the hip hop artists in China are producing. It's more like, uh, you know, a process of us as listeners, right, sort of decoding uh, what uh, historical movements and uh, what the style that the artists are putting on might, you know, speak uh, to uh, people across culture. And, uh, you know, the, the way I sort of, you know, read into their, uh, you know, reference to some artwork in the past that are not, you know, maybe not easily uh, visible or easily uh, apparent to uh, the younger generation who have not been exposed to, you know, cultural productions of an older era. Uh, so it is, you know, my reading is a very personal reading based on, you know, the sort of bits and pieces I become exposed to in my uh, everyday life uh, or, you know, the, the sort of cultural productions I encounter in my own research. So I think everybody can do it in a uh, different way. So I guess that's a more, you know, comprehensive way of explaining what I call relating to sort of reduce, you know, the, the commodity or this cultural production uh, by the group. Uh, to sort of disconstruct, to deconstruct the totality of this product, right? But to sort of uh, look at it more as uh, a product benefiting from transnational flows from across history. Yes. Thank you, Faye. Um... Okay, because we have limited amount of time, I just want to say thank you for all of your questions. We're going to go for one last, uh, one more question for Keisha. Um, does general Chinese culture just see American Black culture as a culture that embodies and expresses oppression, and therefore they use it as a metonym for oppression? Thank you. I hope I finished us out on a good note um, on this question. And this is a loaded question. Um, one of the things that I really did discover in looking at kind of the Maoist period um, was that the representations or kind of the ways in which African Americans were depicted. Some common language in terms of the articles that were uh, translated into the uh, People's Daily, um, some of the propaganda posters, it was very much about um, just struggle. You see the word oppression come up over and over again, and also American imperialism. And I think it was not necessarily just seen African Americans as um, kind of struggling oppression, but that was a means in where, as Amory Brady says, they're trying to pursue a particular narrative and kind of build a new China and its foreign relation policy, making the foreign serve China. And so in many cases, that was the narrative that was put out that was some ways grafting towards how new China saw itself as coming from, in these ways, this cloak of oppression coming to its own, putting itself out there as its new nation state, but how it saw itself in many cases on the global world stage, where the PRC was not um, recognized as as China in the United Nations. You know, the, the CCP was not seen as a legitimate government. And in many cases, they were trying to find in some ways their own particular footing and then a kind of global space. Um, I do think there are some moments where that was useful, but that's not necessarily the only means of seeing our Black culture because one of the forms of music that was seen as very popular and that was kind of used and kind of making connections was Negro spirituals. They make their way over to China through a singer named Aubrey Pankey, who goes in 1955 for two months in November and December of that year and they're making connections to idea of uh, folk music in China to Negro spirituals in the United States. And they're making connections about cultural connections. And in this case, while we know that Negro spirituals come out of the slave tradition and a moment of oppression, that was not the only means they're trying to make connections to that music. There had been a connection to black music before this, where in the 1920s, you have a lot of black jazz musicians who are going to China. And it was seen as a moment of, of uplift for them because they were able to go into clubs and play in spaces where in the United States, they would have to be relegated 
to certain venues, have to go through the back doors, not stay, have stay in segregated spaces or not have space to stay at all. Whereas they were in China, they actually actually saw this as opportunity for uplift as well. And those spaces were celebrated in these huge clubs uh, like the Calendron uh, in, in Shanghai. So there are some ways in which there is kind of oppression, uh, sometimes is used in certain spaces, especially in that kind of political narrative in certain moments. But there's also a means in where they're looking at sometimes the richness and trying to find, in many cases, the way in which trying to find um, the creation of a voice when you've been marginalized in the space and how that idea of creation has been useful in certain cases, how the ways in which they're expressing blackness and black culture can be seen as, I think as uh, the panelists mentioned, a means of connecting across the different spaces. And so while oppression is one form, we see this kind of metonym through the translation of Uncle Tom's Cabin, it does not always stay that way. It has ebbs and flows throughout uh, the kind of the historical narrative throughout modern China, even to, to this day. Um, for example, people love stuff on Marbury in China. It's like interesting to see this black man from the U.S. is like this hero in China's interesting ways and how you see change its representation of black women, which we didn't get to a lot of here, but how in the 60s and things, black women were really in some ways uh, shaping this narrative and how they were very much a part of this as well. And so I think there's a lot here that one, one aspect of it is that, but it's not the only one as well. But I think the question I'm trying to get back to here is how do we parse this out to kind of see the complexities of, you know, is it appreciation? Is it appropriation? How do we think about this through and kind of get to the nuances of the context to see how this was playing out and how can we really kind of think about this from uh, the Chinese perspective looking out, not the out perspective looking in. So I hope I answered that in a hopefully good way to close us out. Totally. It's a, I, I, I really appreciate you bringing us back around to the complexities there. Um, and uh, I think that hopefully this is uh, the beat, you know, part of a lot more learning that we can all do. And there's a lot of resources that people have been sharing in the chat. So thank you for that. And I'm um, sorry we can't get to everyone's questions. Um, people are sharing wonderful insights here, but we, uh, we're about 10 minutes over now and I want to acknowledge time. So we're going to close out for today. And I want to again thank Faye and Keisha and Claire um, and Salvador and Wenchran and, and Poster House for, for joining in this. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs>